Marissa, and uh, you're you're going to be, uh, I know introducing our guest, I want to just say before you do that, that we want you to uh, share your questions with us, either using the Q&A uh, aspect or also the chat, we'll be watching that. Obviously, we've got so many folks here, we won't be able to get to all of those questions, but after Micah's presentation, we'll get to as many as we can. So with that said, uh, Krissa, uh, introduce our guest for us today. Excellent. Well, we are so excited to have Mike Gaudet here with us today, who you probably already are somewhat familiar with because he definitely has a name in the AI world. Um, he's currently the Deputy CD Manager in Maricopa, Arizona, and a public administration expert. Um, I will tell you, Micah has some great information on his LinkedIn page um, and some other articles out there. So if you don't already follow him there, I would recommend that. But um, I'm not going to go too in-depth because if you want to read the full bio, you can always visit the SGR webpage and see it there. I will go ahead and get to it and turn it over to Micah. Thank you, Krista, and thank you, Mike. Appreciate this. We'll get started here. Let me share my screen, and we'll start talking about AI, specifically in HR here. So hopefully everyone can see the screen here, unlocking generative AI for human resources. So one of the things we want to do as we go through this Wednesday webinars, and, and it's really cool, and thank you, SGR, for inviting me to be a participant in it and help, help with this out, is as we think about generative AI, we wanted to kind of focus on the different functional areas of local government. And so that's kind of our, our, our thought process as we go into this. And right away, you know, we know how critical human resources are for local governments, right? Talent wins everything when it comes to what we're doing. And so we want to start with, with human resources and talk about some of the ways that Generative AI might uh, be applicable, might be helpful within your human resources departments and, and the different areas you're doing. So first off, you know, why use AI and HR? What's the, what's the point of that, right? A lot of it comes down to efficiency in things like repetitive tasks, such as resume screening, interview scheduling. Um, we can also use it to personalize the employee onboarding experiences or exit interviews, um, looking at different recommendations and tailoring the needs to our local city and not necessarily taking a one size fits all approach to everything, but really honing in on what works best for our city and what works best for our organization, our people, our needs, our challenges. And AI has some really cool tools to be able to help us to do that. And so what I want to show you too is some of the, basically the, the three tools that I think are going to be most impactful for HR. You know, there are so many tools out there. It's almost hard to keep track of all the new AI tools that come out seemingly every single minute. Um, but these are some of the three tools that I personally use in a, on a day-to-day -day basis, and I think you'll find a lot of value from it. And those three tools are simply perplexity, which is uh, great for research, gives you some verifiable responses. Kind of think of it as a Google on steroids is kind of the best way to, to describe it. Other one is Claude. Claude AI has an ability to, to interact with large files. You can upload up to five files at a time, depending on the size of the files. We can summarize, edit, generate written content. I use this a lot when I'm doing, uh, maybe I'm reviewing a draft job description and I might want a different language in there. I might want to like, look, kind of look side by side and look line by line through that job description. Very helpful. And of course, the one that's probably the most popular, ChatGPT, has some really significant features in that. The only difference in ChatGPT, I'll just say this off the, off the bat too, some of the stuff I will show was going to be on the advanced model, which costs $20 per month. On the Perplexity and Claude, I'll be showing the free versions of those. They have a lot of capabilities on the free versions, which is pretty awesome. Um, but the ability to do things like generate images, data visualizations, upload files on ChatGPT, that's all under the, uh, the paid model there which unfortunately I get absolutely no revenue for, for plugging OpenAI's chat GPT. I wish I did sometimes, but so we'll begin here. And I want to kind of show you just a quick overview of what perplexity looks like. That way, when you get into the system, you kind of know what I'm doing. I might move kind of fast being used to the tool. So I wanted to take a pause and kind of show you where these different things are at. So you can see the new thread Icon is where you're going to start a new prompt. Your library is where you're going to access your previous prompts and previous conversations. Within that box, we call that the prompt box. So that's where we can ask questions. Uh, we can attach files there. 
the co-pilot option allows us to really connect to the internet and pull sourcing, which as you'll see in a second here, is extremely valuable, especially when it comes to some of the concerns over things like hallucinations or getting inaccurate answers from AI sources. This is helpful because then I can go in and check the sources and, and verify that what I'm receiving and what I'm looking at is appropriate and it actually works here. So with that being said, Let's go ahead and give you a I'll give you a quick overview of what Copilot does, right? And how this thing actually is going to work real quick here. So basically you think of it like a Google, right? Where you're asking it a question or you're looking for a certain type of information. So for example, I used it, we were going through our budgeting process right now in this city. And <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things that was in a, a budget request was thermal imaging cameras that were intrinsically safe. Now, I've never purchased thermal Im imaging cameras before, and to put the budget request together, we want to make sure we have an accurate quote, an accurate uh, idea of what this um, the request is. And so I just simply put into perplexity what is, you know, or find me thermal imaging cameras that are intrinsically safe. And sure enough, it did that, gave me some sources, gave me some sites and some vendor sites to, be able to at least get an accurate or a rough estimate of what the price you might ask. So basically, it captures the essence of your query. Sometimes it might ask clarifying questions for search refinement. We'll see that an example here shortly. And then it's going to search a variety of answers across the internet for relevant quality answers. Um, you're going to receive a concise, substantial answers. But the, again, the key feature to this is the ability to look at your sources and look at what um, what that what it's actually saying there. So, with that said, let's go ahead and see it in action here. You can follow along at perplexity.ai um, or scan the QR code. I'm going to switch my screen here. Give me one quick second to do that. Hey, Micah. Yes. Your uh, reminder is showing on your on your presentation. The risk. If you can oh, get out of that. Thank you for telling me that. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. No yeah, if anybody wants to go to a, a risk management meeting, happy to happy to have you guys attend with. I'm just kidding. I'm more um, excited about the birthdays you, you have coming up to celebrate, Micah. Yes, I, I try to do that where I put all the birthdays on, on my team on my calendar. That way, if I see them throughout the day, I can uh, I can wish them a happy birthday. Um, so let me go ahead and, and share my screen here again. Thank you for that, that mic. Um, so let's go over here and I'll share this side of the screen here so you can see this. So perplexity.ai, and I just searched it here in Google that we can see how easy it is to, to pull up and to find. So what we're gonna see here is we're gonna, basically I, I've already signed in. You can sign in with a, a simple Google email password or something like that, like a Google account or just a simple email and password. Doesn't cost anything to, to subscribe to it or to, uh, to join in. And we're gonna ask it to find a city's progressive discipline policy. So say we're wanting to update a progressive discipline policy, we want to see that. You can see I have Copilot turned on. So I'm going to keep this turned on for now so you can see what happens. It's going to ask the question. Now it's asking me to provide the name of the city I'm interested in. That's that clarifying question. For right now, I'm, I'm going to leave it blank and not say a city because maybe I'm just looking across the landscape of any city disciplinary policy to kind of see what's out there. So again, I'm going to understand that question. I'm going to search the web, find these sources, and this is where this comes in, right? Is you know it talks about how it varies by city and things like that. But as you can see here, I can then go ahead and click on these different links, right? Each of these different numbers here are sources to the information. So let's see if I can make this work here. If I click on this one, hopefully I can see this one. I think this is. Is this Cedar Rapids? Let's see if it loads up here. So Cedar City. So hopefully you all can see that. So right away, not only am I able to, so this is really helpful for drawing information in, right? It's like a Google on steroids where I can actually go in and see, okay, yes, this is actually a disciplinary policy for the city of Cedar City. Super helpful. I can go in there, go back to the site here. I can look at the one from Salina, Texas. There's one from Iowa. There's one from Durham, North Carolina. So really, really helpful to be able to source information and find information quickly that's verifiable. You, when we think of how we use Google typically and how Google works with 
site engine optimizations and keywords and and paid ads to put at the top of the list. To me, this is a, a very, very helpful tool when you're doing research. And I know HR does a lot of research on things like um, em employee costs, on um, uh, you know maybe some salary studies and salary comparisons across other cities and things like that. Very, very helpful and very, very powerful tool there. So I'm going to stop the screen here again and go back to my other guy here. Give me one second to do that here while we switch screens again. So let me do this again. And here we are back on our slide share here. So the next one we talk about then is Claude and what Claude does. Again, a very powerful, very helpful, helpful tool here in Claude. So Claude, what this does is again, it's super helpful. Let's go back here, a slide here. Super helpful for analyzing and updating um, kind of a larger form content in what they're doing here. So I can attach a budget. I can attach things uh, like PDFs or whatnot. One of the ways I've been using this recently is we have a, we have a, a very active legislative session here in the state of Arizona. So a lot of bills are coming through. And so one of the things we're doing is reviewing bills and seeing what the impact may or may not be for uh, the city, right? And so I'm able to attach the bill language here that's publicly available on the state legislators' websites attach that to the Claude system, and then just ask it to go through and find, uh, you know, what are the new additions? What are the proposed languages? I, and just kind of ask it basic questions to be able to quickly understand what that is. And then afterwards, you know, always either before or after, we'll always go in and read the entirety of the bill on my own, just to make sure I'm not missing anything or not saying anything different. So it's kind of helpful for a review of that. This can be helpful too for things like job descriptions or a job application where I might take a, a job application I received and then compare that against the essential uh, skills and knowledge and abilities that are required of that job posting and kind of see how the candidates may or may not rank in that and how they might uh, how we might be able to you know bring the candidate for the interview, which is extremely helpful because sometimes when you're reading through you know, sometimes hundreds of, of job applications and job resumes and whatnot, candidate resumes, sometimes we can miss some things. And so this is helpful to, to kind of have a second review. Obviously, again, same idea with the bill review. I'm always reading through the resume on my own too, just to make sure I have that human review of it and that human loop of it, not relying only on AI technology, but using it to augment and see things that I might have missed in the review process. So Again, on the uh, the breakdown of it, you you know the menu here, your name, your initials there on the uh, right side of the screen. There is going to be your settings menu. You can put your prompt there. You can see that prompt box. You can see where we can attach files, and you can see also where you can access your previous prompts. So let me do this now. Let me go to Claude and let's see this guy in action here. So bear with me one second, and let's go to Claude. All right, so I'm gonna, here's Claude. So again, very simple, Claude.ai, and pretty simple to use, pretty simple to uh, to see here. So you come in here, again, I'm already signed in, so not a, uh, you know, same idea with perplexity, just signing with a, an email account, um, free to use. There's, there's a paid model within Claude that, increase the number of prompts you can have in a given time limit. Personally, I've never felt or had the need to to pay for the pro version of Claude. Um, so just if you're using it as a power user, maybe you'd want to think about that. I've never run into that yet. So so what we can do here is let's let's do some job job descriptions here within Claude and we'll see this and we'll compare the same thing too over in chat GPT when we get there as well. So for this one, let's say we're going to create a job description for an assistant at the city manager in, I don't know how if I'm pronouncing this right way, Framingham, Massachusetts. So it's going to go through and give me a, a typical, you know, probably guesstimate of the salary range, give me a summary, and it's going to go through and draft this entire job description for me here. So let's see what happens when we do this. It's, it's getting through here with this job description. Um, 
again, what you'll notice here within Claude as well too, compared to say ChatGPT4, is at times the ChatGPT4 engine is a little faster. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And when I say faster, it's it's like the difference between five seconds per response versus three seconds per response or something. It's pretty minimal, but sometimes you will notice that difference uh, when you're when you're doing that. So here we go. It's a cool job description. It kind of gives us this whole idea here. Now, one of the things that's interesting too that we can do is, you know, we all have our different templates for how we're using or how we're developing job descriptions, right? Some people might call the beginning the essential duties. Some people might call it the executive summary. Some folks might call it the general summary, right? We have different nomenclature that we use for that. So what we can do here is I can attach this file. And so I'm gonna put a prompt in here first and you'll see what we're gonna do. So we're gonna create a job description, but I'm gonna give it a sample template, a sample job description to use as the template. And I'm gonna add that content here. So let's go in here. And this is a job description from the city of Framingham that's completely different, right? It's actually a Department of Parks and Recreation intern job description, but thinking through that the formatting is gonna be somewhat the same regardless of the job title itself. So we uploaded this here. And now it's going to put it in the exact template that we wanted to have it in, right? Talk about the summary and go through the list there. So extremely helpful to be able to, to look at that. We could also go in and see what does it mean? Like what are the essential duties for that intern, right? Or that intern job description. We, we can ask questions against that job description as well too and get some insights and get some, some follow on there. So again, really helpful and really easy way to do this. This is one of those things with creating job descriptions that has a relatively low risk in terms of concerns about accuracy and things like that, right? Because the, the system's not necessarily going to tell, you know, I'm creating a job description for an assistant to the city manager position. It's not going to insert in there that this person's going to have arrest powers or the ability to, uh, to go into IDLHA. IDLH environments, right? So it's not going to have a whole lot of, of concern on that end. The one thing you're going to do, though, is if you have certain language, if you have certain ide uh, ideologies and cultures that you want to make sure is communicated within your job description, you might have to go in there, either tell it to do that or um, tell it to uh, or, or manually do that, right? So I can say on here, just for example, please add in language for, uh, let's say for leadership development. And let's see what we do here, right? Let's, so we should be able to do, let's, let's just go in here. And again, we can just show us how we can iterate and how we can update the model and update the system here. So it's gonna be able to go in there, add some language on leadership development and things like that. And that way we can add the different things to our prompts. So Generally speaking, don't take the first, you know, don't take the first draft and go with it. Iterate a little bit, refine it, make sure it you can really make it yours and make it work for what you for what you want to see from that. So let's go back over to the other guy here, back to this presentation. And I'll share my screen again. So the, the next one then is the infamous. ChatGPT, right? We have all heard of this. Hopefully some of you guys have already used this and have played around with it. So the the ChatGPT system, sometimes they change the uh, the layout, right? Sometimes they, they move the furniture around of where things are at. So right now, this is what it looks like. The, uh, the, the menu on top there, you just drop down, that's where you access ChatGPT4. Then now has Dolly, which is its image generation, browsing analysis, used to be called code interpreter or advanced data analytics and all that embedded into one chat system. And then you also have the 3.5, which is the free version, great for everyday tasks. And then you also have your plugins and things like that you'll have there. On the side, you'll see, you can, you can uh, I'll highlight over this, hopefully you can see that. You can, this little arrow there where it's pointing to, that's a little white, uh, gray box. You can toggle your previous prompts closed or open there. Again, the attached files, the uh, the start new prompt box, and so we can uh, we can 
move forward here and see this in action then. Again, follow along, use the QR code if you want to, or follow along at uh, chat.openai.com. And let's go back here and see it in action. So give me one second again. I'm going to go through and show this for us so we can see this guy in action, what this actually is going to look like. So here we are. Let's share the screen. And here we are, ChatGPT, right? Again, just Google ChatGPT. It should be the first thing to come up. You just click on it. The exact same as if you would within Perplexity, Claude, anything like that. You can sign up for free and just using a, a simple email account and password that you can just go ahead and, and get signed up there. So pretty easy to, to, to go ahead and use. So let me show you this here. Let's do the same thing. I'm going to throw the same prompt that we used last time within the Claude system, just so you can see a little bit of a difference of how these systems are, are interacting and using the same prompt. So again, I'm going to attach the same job description here we used before. It's going to upload the PDF, hit enter, and now it's going to go through and look at this job description. And it should be able to generate a job description for us. One of the things you notice too is on ChatGPT, it has the ability to do things like adding bold text or things like that, which I find somewhat helpful at times. That can be very a very useful tool for that. So again, it's going to give us the, the essential functions, education, training, experience, knowledgeability, and skill, and go through and put this together. Now, one of the cool things, too, about ChatGPT that we can do is we can take this and actually download this as a document. So I can say, download this job description as a Word doc. So it's going to analyze it. And while it's doing that, I'm going to grab a quick glass of water. So it's going to analyze, look at that in the background. We click on this little tab right here. You can see what it's doing, right? It's creating the document, doing all the stuff behind the scenes here, We're using Python to do that. So it's going to go ahead and analyze it, and then it will give should be able to give me a downloadable link that I can then click on, and then I have that job description as a Word document. You can also do the same thing for PDFs if you want to, if you're working with, say, uh, some data that you're creating or a table you're creating, you can download that as an Excel file. Again, I'm, I'm kind of hammering on the, the the idea of human the loop idea, which I think is extremely important. So one of the things I like to do is I like to download these things as a Word document, and that way I can go ahead and do different editing of it within the Word document, just a little easier for me to do. And so again, you just click on this guy right here, and then it'll pop up. You can see that there you go. It's it's uh, my Word document is saved there. So some really, really cool things that you can do in terms of, of how you're leveraging and how you're doing this. The other thing we can do too is we can actually, here in ChatGPT 3.5, which is the free version, we can still do a, quite a lot with this, right? So let's say, let's give a, let's, uh, let's create a fictional situation where we have a, a new police chief from the city of Providence, Rhode Island, and we're going to call this new police chief, we'll call her Sarah Jennings, right? So we want the ChatGPT to create a press release bio for this new hire. Now, last night I had AI draft me a fake bio for uh, this chief Jennings here. And so here we go. I have this entire bio that I basically just copy and paste it in here. And you can see it basically just talks about how this was a, a, a former commander or previously a commander in Newport, Rhode Island. So now we just hit enter. I put, again, this is just copy and pasting into here. I'm not uploading any documents. I'm just copy and pasting the information into here. And we can see here, it's going to create this entire press release for us, right? Talking about the uh, the experience that Commander Jennings had in their previous experience, her uh, degrees from the University of Rhode Island and from Roger Williams University. Again, this fictitious uh, in this fictitious situation. This is not a real person, so I just want to clarify that. But you know, as you do press releases or as you do different things like announcing hires of uh, especially key personnel right in the cities, this can be a very helpful and easy way to draft this. Right, you can see within the 3.5 model it 
really generated is very, very fast, right? We can even put in there the immediate contact name, the title, the phone number, the email address, and things like that. So really, really helpful tool to be able to do that. Another thing we'll see here too is, you know, one of the one of the important functions that HR plays is in hiring our police officers and things like that, right? So I'm going to show you the difference between what the 3.5 model is doing and how quickly it does it versus the four version, how uh, maybe a little more robust that is. So we're going to ask it to create a testing process for sergeants in the city of Morgan Hill, California Police Department. So it's going to go through, give me the testing components, oral board, assessment center, performance evaluation, again, generated this very, very fast, right, which is extremely helpful. So we have, you know, you can go through and see the different elements that we have here, different ideas we have. Again, we can kind of go through and iterate this if we have different things we want to put in there from our city's perspective or from the needs of our cities. But let me show you what this looks like then within Dolly, right? So if I say the same thing, it'll probably take a little more time. But what we should notice, though, is it might be a little more robust in terms of its response. So here we go, it talks about the written examination. Again, you'll see just a quick you know, example is on the first example, we're getting two bullet points and rather, rather, you know, relatively short bullet points in summary. And here on each section, we're getting three bullet points and a little more, uh, a little more content given to us here as well too. Talking about the psychological evaluation, it's going through and talking about community interaction. So you can see that the, the four model, even though it's taking longer, is giving a little bit more robust answers, which can be which can be helpful, especially when we're developing processes and things like that can be extremely, extremely useful and helpful though. Another thing we can do here as well is, you know, we're talking about uh, how this can be used in HR. And again, HR, extremely valuable partners when it comes to our, our recruitment efforts for police departments here. But let's say we wanna create an exit interview survey for the city of Tulare, California. So we can use this same thing too. And I'll use an example of creating questions. Think in mind too, this how this can also be used for say job application questionnaires, right? So we could do is we could go ahead and, and take in a job description, right? And ask it to generate a list of questions based on that job description. So just think of the different tools and ways you can use this, right? Beyond what we're seeing here, let your, you know, kind of let your creative, creative mind go wild with this and see what you can do. So again, you can see a pretty great way to create this this questionnaire. And again, the same thing like I did with the job description, I can then take this and download this as a file to be able to see and be able to interact with it better. Maybe I want some of the questions worded differently. Maybe I want to move some of the questions around and I can do all that within that Word document file by simply downloading this as a Word document, editing that Word document, and then also sending that document out to my team members to be able to, uh, to collaborate on, get their input, and then use across the organization. Although one we can do too is, you know, onboarding is such an important process for human resources. And we want to have that welcoming and uh, defining moment for our new team members that come on. So let's say we're going to create a onboarding program for the city of West Allis, Wisconsin. I see Rebecca, city, uh, city administrator here from West Allis on the session here. She and I got a chance to meet at uh, an AFI uh, pop-up conference in Gilbert, Arizona. It was kind of fun to, to meet her because actually I was born in West Dallas, Wisconsin. So it's kind of fun to, to get a chance to, to meet her and interact with her and hear about some of the cool things they're doing over there in my uh, my old hometown, West Dallas, Wisconsin. So again, it's going to create this idea of what we want to have for an employee onboarding discussion. So if we're not already having these things or if we have something we want to revamp and revise, this is a great tool to be able to kind of see this and get some ideas uh, from AI to see, okay, what would an onboarding session look like? How do we go about doing that? You can see the time ideas that's giving you kind of rough estimate for timelines because I asked to do this within a four hour window. So super, super helpful that we can do there. The other one we're going to show here, we'll run through a couple more examples here and then I'll turn things back over to, to Mike and Krista for any type of Q&A. 
So let's just say we talk about the town of Gilbert, Arizona, having you know met Rebecca there. So let's say we're going to we're tasked with writing a comprehensive um, leave policy that encompasses all types of leave, right? Sick, vacation, administrative, et cetera. So let's see if we can do this and see if it can cite appropriate laws that may govern that. Sometimes the citation works, sometimes it doesn't work. We'll test it out and see what happens. We'll, we'll live on the edge a little bit here. So one of the things you'll notice here as well is in the prompt, I gave it the role, right? I told it to assume the role of a HR director, right? It gives it the context of what you're dealing with and what you're doing. Um, sometimes I might say, I am, and then insert role into my prompt before I give it the direction of, of what I want to ask. That role idea can be extremely helpful to tailor down exactly what you want the model to, how you want the model to behave and what kind of responses that you want. The one thing I'd share with you too, when it comes to prompting and things like that, there was a, a recent post on LinkedIn that I saw from an individual who works at OpenAI and the I think he's in the in the development role or something like that. And he said that the three most critical skills to learn in 2024 when it comes to interacting with AI and prompt engineering are listening, reading, or speaking rather, speaking, reading, and writing, right? Just, and I would add in there listening as well too. So when it comes to interaction with AI models, one of the key skills that we have to learn is kind of the basic human communication skills. Um, so keep that in mind too when you're when you're prompting. The basic idea is, you know, talk to it like it, as if it's a human, right? Sometimes I'll go in here and I'll say things like please and thank you. And that's just because when that takes over the world, I want it to remember that I said please and thank you. Um, so we can see here, here's the uh, the idea for the kind of an outline for this policy here. It's going to give me sick leave, vacation leave, administrative leave, bereavement leave, FMLA, disciplinary actions for leave abuse, policy and legal compliance, amendments. So it's a comprehensive leave policy. And I can say this, I can say, I don't like the bullets. Can we put this into paragraph format. So here it's going to go through and I'll probably get rid of the bullets and then put it into a paragraph format. It's typically how we have our policies drafted. At least in my experience, most of my policies are in paragraph format instead of bulletized and things like that. So really, really helpful tool to be able to go in and see how quickly we can go ahead and, and do this. So we put it in a bullet paragraph, and again, I can download that as a document, revise it, put it through the policy review committees, and then publish that out and, and see that there. So pretty wonderful way, especially as we're maybe developing a new policy, revising a policy, I can upload an old policy into here, one that I want to revise, ask questions against it, uh, have it generate some language that um, maybe I didn't think of at the time, right? Some some better ways to communicate and better ways to to let our team members know about the different policies that we have. So let me stop sharing. Let me go back over here to our presentation. Give me one second here. Let's go back here. Okay, okay. All right, so hopefully we can see this here. Let me just go like this, we can see a little better. All right, the, the, the final thing I wanna show you through, and I'll just, um, I'll briefly touch on this and if for the sake of time, is these ideas called GPTs, right? GPTs is basically a way to be able to isolate your data within a GPT model, and so, for instance, when I'm asking it questions on developing a leave policy or things like that, it's pulling all of its wide sources of information that it knows about leave policies, that it knows about Arizona Revised Statutes, that it knows about uh, the city of Gilbert and things like that. And so what we can do within GPTs is we can actually tailor this down to only being our own system and, and ask questions against our own questions, right? So here it is. Here's where you get to. I'll show you where to get to create a GPT. I think this is a very, very useful tool when it comes to HR. I see a lot of applications for it. 
So I'm going to show you quickly how to how we would create it and then show you one that I created for an HR department or if they want to use it for an HR department to show what that looks like here. So here within the GPT model, when you go into it, you're going to see kind of how you create the GPTs. Basically, you're going to create it using simple language. This is a no code solution to, to doing this. You can upload files that you want to be trained on. You can just tell it, hey, I want to create a GPT to uh, I'm a GPT trained on my HR policy manual or my HR personnel manual. And you can create those things like that too. You can test out the GPT and see that. So again, let me go ahead and show you what this looks like. And what I'm gonna do here, here's what it looks like within the GPT system. So let me go back into chat GPT itself and show you we can see this. So what we're gonna do within the system is just click on explore GPTs. I'm already in there. And then we can do is we can either click on create or view my GPTs. Well, quickly I'll click create so you can see what this looks like. We can go in here, we can say create a system that allows me to ask questions against my city's personnel manual. I'm not gonna hit enter. I don't want the system to, to start working on that. I just wanna show you how easy it is to do this, right? I can do this for personnel manuals. I've also done this for something like a city code, right? I can upload all my code documents into there and have a GPT that's just trained on my city code. So you can do that. What it'll do, do is it'll go through, create an image for you for a logo, you can go in here to configure, you can change the name of your GPT, add a description to it, give it some custom instructions, like what do you want it to avoid doing? Uh, you can add these different files to it as well that it can be trained on, give it capabilities like web browsing, image generation, code interpreter, and, and whatnot. So let me show you what this looks like in kind of real life. I'm gonna go to my GPTs over here, which is all of my different GPTs that I have. And let me see where is, this guy here. Give me a quick second to see if I can find this. A load more. There we go. So this Arizona State Policy Guide is one I created that what it does is it's trained on the Arizona State Employee Handbook. And so I uploaded that, told it to only answer questions on the Arizona State Employee Handbook. So I can say, what are the requirements for taking FMLA? It's going to think through, ask these different questions here, and it's going to give me answers that are only from this policy, right? Which is extremely helpful because sometimes we have different policy language. Sometimes we have different uh, different policies, right? So, for instance, the city of West Dallas, Wisconsin, you know, a phenomenal city uh, that got to be uh, to live in for a number of years. They might have a different policy on, say, uh, progressive discipline than the city of Maricopa does, right? And so when I ask ChatGPT a question about progressive discipline policies, I really want my employees to only get the answers from my own policy, right? I don't want them to, to necessarily get confused by looking at something from, from Gilbert, Arizona, from West Allis, Wisconsin, from you know Fort Collins, Colorado, or things like that, right? I want to be isolated to my own system here. And so you can see that it's going to give me these answers. These are answers directly from the Arizona State Employee Handbook. And one thing we can do too as well is we can see here why, what it looks like when we ask a question that's not located within the GPT model. I prompted it in the beginning under the defined roles and custom instructions. I said, do not, if a question is outside the policy, you know, tell it to consult their supervisor or HR. And so I can say, what should, just a kind of a funny example, what should employees do in the event of a zombie attack? And so you can see here that custom instruction I gave it of, you know, I can't find the answer, consult with your supervisor and or HR was put into the prompt. And that way I know that all the answers I'm getting from this is gonna be directly sourced from the HR policy manual for the state of Arizona. So with that being said, hope I hope that is helpful. I hope that's, that's educational, to be able to see what you can do there. Some really great applications, especially the GPTs, what we're able to do there and to see 
how we can really tailor these things. You think of you know our different codes, our HR policies, onboarding, things like that. So many applications and things that you know. These are just some things I've learned too over the years, and I'm sure that I'll learn more interacting with you all as you do this on a day to day basis too. So hope that's useful. Hope that's helpful. Again, thank you, Mike. Thank you, uh, Krista, for for inviting me to participate and to uh, to join this journey with you all. Wow, Micah, thank you so much. This has been awesome. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but this is one I'm going to have to go back and watch on the YouTube channel just to to make sure I'm I'm getting it. Krista, tell us a little bit about that, what we can do if we want to watch it again. And then, Micah, i got a couple of questions for you. Sure. So um, we do have this recorded, and it will be available shortly on the SGR YouTube channel. So it's just youtube.com at government resources. Uh, you can also, I put the link in the chat as well. Um, I'll drop it again in just a second, just for those of you, so you don't have to scroll too far back. Um, but you can link, there will also be a link on our webpage. Um, and you can follow our Facebook page and see it there. We we have it streaming live right now on the SGR Facebook page. So feel free to like and uh, comment, share, et cetera. Subscribe to the YouTube channel so you get those updates. But um, and then, of course, if anyone has any issues or trouble accessing or questions, feel free to contact me and I'll put my email in the chat box as well, just in case. Yeah, thank you, Krista. Okay. Micah, the, the biggest questions we've gotten have been around security and um, confidentiality for applicant files and so forth. What's your take on the security issue? I think it's important, right? And so a couple of things I've I'll mention is that number one, if you notice in the prompts that I gave it and the files I uploaded, all that information is publicly available information, right? I'm only putting in information that's already accessible on, you know, it's it's online. It's I can, I can, anyone can go online and find the job description for the Parks Rec intern in Framingham, Massachusetts, right? When it comes to things like resumes and whatnot, one way that we can kind of help out with that is to anonymize the data. And so what I might do is I might get rid of the name and address and other like that and just keep in, say, the the body of the resume and use that to analyze it. Or I might have my resume separated and just say, OK, what are based on the job description, based on the job posting, what are some essential skills that I should look for within this job posting? Right. And so if you're concerned about security, there's other ways you can you can manage that, you know. I'm not a lawyer, don't even play one on TV either. So uh, definitely consult your your legal team and your risks team to see what's appropriate for you and your city. There's probably not a one size fits all approach to it, Mike. Yeah, that might be uh, something that we collaborate with you and, and our AFI and strategic foresight team to come up with some, some helpful answers for, because we had a lot of the questions kind of related to that. And uh, I, I know everyone's concerned and one of connected to that is how to convince others, you know, leaders and then say other departments, maybe IT that, okay, we can do this. So that those are going to be issues that I guess everybody has to kind of work through, right? Exactly, Mike. And again, for me, I, I put in information that's publicly available, right? This is information that's already online. You can do a Google search and find the information online. It's a city budget that's published. It's a job description that's published. And so when I'm putting it into the model, into the system, I'm not jeopardizing any type of security thing because it's already publicly available information out there. Yeah, great. Well, thanks so much. He's good. Micah is going to be back with us uh, the first Wednesday of every month. So March 6th, Yeah, he'll be doing another webinar on AI matters and related to local government. So can't wait for that one. And if you are interested in maybe having uh, our strategic foresight or AFI team come and do a workshop uh, for your organization. We can do that. We've got House and Lay, our manager of strategic foresight on with us. Uh, House, and you want to say anything about uh, workshops? Yeah, sure. Uh, if, you know, if I could have some permission to show my video, I'm happy to show my smile. But um, yeah, these are workshops um, really designed to do on generative AI, really designed to do three things. Uh, to provide an introduction to AI, to automate, um, you know, at least one task uh, off of participants' plates. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things I've seen are 
pretty significant, like creating policy that used to take 30 hours down to 30 minutes. Um, it, it, it was, it, it was like the, uh, the relief that, uh, was on their face was really satisfying. And, um, yeah. And then the third is to wrestle with the, the big questions, right? I, I hear a lot of concerns around privacy and, and there's other ethical implications that come with using a, a technology as powerful as AI. And, and so we hold space to talk about them. So I think that's, that's really what we do is get local governments started on their AI journey. Um, and we've noticed more and more of our participants are using the opportunity to begin training their own cities um, on AI. So, yeah. All right. Great. Well, so feel free to reach out to us about that. I want to invite you to join in next week. We have our uh, good friend Randy Mayu is going to be doing an executive book briefing on the book, The Wisdom of the Bullfrog by Admiral William McRaven. Great, great book. Uh, I've read that one. I've also uh, heard Randy present on it. You will really enjoy it. So that's 11 o'clock uh, Central next Wednesday. Thanks for joining us, and we will see you down the road. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.